So I'm uh, speaking with composer Joel Duick, uh, whose versatile work ran ranges from nature documentaries, feature films, animated series, and more. Uh, Joel got his start working in anime series like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh!, he recently scored the David Attenborough narrated uh, documentaries Galapagos 3D, Kingdom of Plants 3D, and Micro Monsters 3D. Joel's score to The Tall Man starring Jessica Biel was also just released on CD. Uh, thank you, Joel, uh, so much for inviting me to your home and, and doing this interview. Thank you, Kaya. Nice to see you again. Um, so we did a great roundtable interview a while back with Alik Alvarez and uh, Freddie Scheinfeld, who are awesome collabor collaborators of yours and mm -hmm. you know who co-composed co with you often. Uh, but now time to focus just on you. Okay. So tell me, how did you get started um, on your musical path, and what led you to composing? Um, I started off uh, learning instruments as a kid. Um, mm -hmm. My first instrument was piano, and uh, I started about six years old, took piano lessons, and then um, uh, I wanted to play in an orchestra. My brother played clarinet, and obviously with the piano I was saddled to home. And so my folks asked me what I wanted to learn, and, and there was no dis discussion for me. It was always very clear that I wanted to be a percussionist, because I'd been tapping on tables, uh -huh. used to get sent out of class. Um, <laughs> they used to call me Tappy Tappy, because I was always drumming away. And, uh, and so then I, I started learning percussion, orchestral percussion, and loved it, and played in the local youth orchestra, and um, I, I was uh, often tasked with playing the cymbal, uh, and it was huge, um, and I was about four foot something, <laughs> and they would put them in my hands just, you know, just for the moment when I would crash them and uh -huh. then take them away because I could hardly lift them up. <laughs> so that's how it started, and I just, I kept it going. I, I you know, I always had uh, a very uh, strong uh, musical um, passion um, uh, that I think probably around when I was 13, 14, then evolved into my buying a drum kit. And, um, and then started playing really more jazz drums than anything else and, and being in various school bands. But it wasn't just the, the rock thing. I always was into, into jazz, into funk. And, um, but, you know, I, um, academically I studied, I actually started a medical school first. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I moved from that into a degree in human sciences and neuroscience. So I was, I was and am very fascinated in um, uh, the way the human brain works. And that's actually come back into my life. Oh, uh, as a composer, human. absolutely. Yeah, exactly. We can even talk about that at some point. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I ended up uh, working eventually for the United Nations. Wow. <laughs> and uh, starting out in Paris. I lived for three years in Paris. And um, some of it underground. Right. And... Uh, <laughs> And then, um, uh, as part of my job at the United Nations, then in New York, um, where I was a specialist in Chernobyl and technological disasters mm -hmm. and landmines, um, I was asked every now and then to do these little documentaries, little public service announcements and uh, UN in action pieces, they were called, for CNN. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would um, habitually use library music, production library music. Right. And so at one point I said, can I write the music? And they said, well, we can't pay you, but knock yourself out. If you want to do it, you can do it. <laughs> and that's when I started to find um, a love of uh, writing music for picture mm -hmm. and particularly for documentary. And also it gave me an opportunity to explore um, one of my other loves, which has been very strong also as a percussionist, is world music. Right. Because you know, all of these documentaries were set in different places, whether it was Rwanda or Cambodia, um, Mozambique, where there were landmine issues, um, or Bosnia. And it gave me a pretext to kind of find out about the music and then try to incorporate it. So I, then I started writing music really, you know, in earnest while I was doing my day job at the UN. Wow. And it got kind of out of proportion. <laughs> uh, and then eventually I decided to quit my job and make a go of it full time. And my first, uh, what I did actually, I, I got trained as a, um, uh, I did a master class in Pro Tools mm -hmm. and kind of got trained in, in those skills and that led to a job as a music editor for Pokemon. That was my first job. Right, I saw that. Uh, yeah. And that's a, I grew up on that. I, I still have my cards, <laughs> yeah, my, my Pokemon cards. Yeah, and it was, 
it was great. I mean, firstly, because, you know, for, for, you know, I wrote a very little bit of music for it. I was very new, but uh, I, I became the senior music editor at one point. I did four seasons of it. And I credit that with being probably the best education I could have, or I think a composer could have, right. um, of how to use music to tell a story. And the reason is because it wasn't with my own music. And so you don't have this attachment. Uh -huh. You can be really objective and saying like, what, um, you know, what's gonna work here and be really kind of brutal about it, try stuff yeah, out yeah. and not be precious about things. And, and also working on incredible time pressure, um, you know, to crank out these episodes and make them look like they're being custom scored, each mm -hmm. one. Um, and so that led to the next show, which was Yu-Gi-Oh! And um, uh, a few of us younger guys who had been working freelance for Four Kids, um, uh, Four Kids Productions, that's the company, right. uh, got a few of us in and said, you know, would you like to all, you know, compete to, to write music for Yu-Gi-Oh! <laughs> and what was interesting is that um, the powers that be in this particular company were convinced that Yu-Gi-Oh! was going to tank. And so they, all the more senior writers, they started writing for another show. I can't remember which one it was, <laughs> Winks or something like that. Um, and it, that show tanked. And so Yu-Gi-Oh! with us bunch of real novices, um, went ballistic, ballistic, it went huge. And it was on oh at God, one point yeah. seven days a week and twice on weekends. And, um, and so we found ourselves, you know, in, in, in a place where, you know, we were doing very ambitious work musically. Uh, putting out all the stops in terms of you know, like full-on epic orchestra all the time and um, on a show that really got some traction and that's really how I got my start and that led to uh, me getting asked back to do uh, the Ninja Turtles right. and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sonic X and F-Zero um, and uh, Shaman King and uh, Kuniku Man, Ultimate just Muscle. So many. Yeah. Um, animated series. <laughs> Lots amazing. of them. Yeah. yeah just and tons of music. We just cranked out the music. And how do you find a, how do you just define a soundscape for each show? They're very, I mean, Japanimation kind of from that, from Japan and Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! They have a very distinct style mm -hmm. and uh, they kind of share similar styles. How did you craft each show to have a different tone what, what what were you looking for that really spoke to you as the musician well um i think with Yu-Gi-Oh, which was my my first real go at this um you know we had some discussions initially about what we wanted it to sound like mm -hmm. and um at the time uh tomb raider had come out the lara croft film uh -huh. and we, you know everyone was really digging that score and and the question was can we do something that's like that that is really convincingly orchestral um, we were thinking about the age group that it was going to and trying right, to speak right. to, let's say, the, the older side of it in a sense and yeah. not, not write it for a bunch of kids, but write it as an epic and quite cinematic score with, you know, with big themes and, and bold ideas. And, um, and that's where we were coming from. And honestly, you know, at the time, I had a very basic studio and um, I just had to learn on the job um, how to do you know, what I now do. Right. Um, and it was often incredibly challenging and there was definitely some blood, sweat and tears and my <laughs> wife can attest to that. It was very, very scary because I had no real uh, background. You know, I didn't study scoring. Right. Um, uh, I didn't study music at university. I was just basing it on whatever I could muster um, out of my, you know, through my own ear and ideas and listening and mm -hmm. uh, and trying to to make it work, but it worked. So, I guess I was doing something right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And now you've uh, found huge success in a, in a lot of uh, these David Nat Attenborough uh, mm -hmm. nature documentaries. And I grew up on a lot of Discovery Channel, National Geographic, um, just and always being aware of being aware of the music in these yeah. shows. And uh, you've done amazing work, as I said, with David Attenborough and, and his documentaries. So when you're dealing with something like that, when you have narration, and and it's not just, it's a different kind of documentary. Mm -hmm. You have natural footage, you have animals, you know, just the kind of presence of them, no uh, dialogue really within mm -hmm. what's happening, just the narration. How does music come into play and how does it get structured and how does it function in those kind of programs? Um, I think... I draw a distinction between, um, let's say, a documentary that's of a political nature, where it's mm -hmm. really it has a storyline or something, 
um, and these uh, big nature documentaries where in many cases they're just kind of pointing a camera at interesting things and, right. and hoping after the fact that they can cut it together into something that's sensical and, and tell a story. Um, and so it's a, it's a little bit more open in that sense. Um, and it also means that we're dealing with all of these kinds of characters. Uh, it could be a plant, it could be a, a beetle, it could be a volcano. And we have to uh, find a way to, to f kind of feel into what the character might be mm -hmm. of, you know, very possibly an inanimate object yeah. <laughs> and, and bring it to life. Right. And at the same time, because it's documentary, uh, we don't want really to speak in overtly manipulative terms emotionally. You know, mm. you need to keep it open so that you, there, there's room for people to, you know, to feel their own way into it and, and get a sense of what it means to them. So it's, it's challenging in a sense to, you know, to figure out, you know, what does a pitcher plant sound like? Right, or what's yeah, the yeah. music of a, um, uh, a fruit bat? But... You know, often the imagery is very persuasive. I'm sure and just the, the visuals of it itself and just cinematography. Very inspiring, yeah. yeah. And, you know, if it's a, you know, a bat, there's, it's, it's, you know, for example, I think it was in uh, Kingdom of Plants, there was a bat. Um, and so I kind of wrote a nocturne because that's yeah. a nocturnal animal and it was it all in slow motion. And so it had this, you know, wonderful uh, mystical quality to mm -hmm. it that I thought yeah. was a good opportunity to explore that, you know, in other situations like Galapagos, where you're dealing with, um, you know, massive volcanoes and overheads and helicopter shots, and it's all in 3D, mm -hmm. we really want to bring across just the vastness uh, of uh, the place and also of the ideas that we're looking at the cauldron of evolution. And these are very strong, persuasive ideas. So um, um, I have a lot of very close collaboration with the editors usually Absolutely, in this yeah, process. Yeah. They seem to be the ones that are making a lot of the the day-to-day -day judgment calls on music. And so we work very closely together to find something that, you know, that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've done a lot of uh, fictional narratives as well, fictional films. Uh so as a storyteller, when you get presented with a movie or a script, uh what aspect of the film inspires your writing the most? Would you say it's the characters, the story, maybe the performance of the actors, the cinematography? What really speaks to you more than the rest of them? I think I'm always looking um, to try to capture what's there and what's not said. Mm -hmm. uh, to try to capture um, what's between the lines that to some extent an expression can convey. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to to go where no composer has come, <laughs> to uh, yeah, to try to find that place uh, that that can't be spoken in words, and it can't be spoken in acting or in gestures. Right. It's something else that only music can speak about. And the way I approach, I think, music for film in general is in the belief that it should sit in a kind of subliminal place. Mm. And, uh, and that for the audience, um, they shouldn't notice that it's there. They should have a very holistic experience and just come out and say, that was an amazing film, and I don't know why. Right. And very often, you know, when I've, when I've seen a great film with a great score, I'll come out and I think, you know, I, I don't know if there was music there yeah. at all. But of course there was. It was serving the picture very, very well. Um, and again, it, it was, it was, if it was pushing you, it was pushing in very, very subtle ways. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I tend to try to skew in that direction and often, you know, there's a little bit of push and pull with the production team over yeah. that, you know, about how, how much do we push people? How much do we, you know, uh, uh, speak in emotional terms and how much do we leave it open? Right. Um, but I, th I think that's. You know, that's where it's at for me. And I think emotionally, um, if I can give people goosebumps, in a sense, where of the good and the bad kind, uh -huh. you know, just because you're hitting something at a very deep uh, level, uh, then I think I I'm doing my job right. Right. 
Uh, and you were speaking earlier about just how your interest in how the human brain works and the psychology and everything. Do you look at the characters in the film kind of in a psychological way, and do you try to use music? It's a very psychological aspect, I think, of human nature. It's beyond words, beyond you know images. Mm-hmm. It's a intense sonic feeling. And I, I talked a lot with Christopher Leonard's about it on his film, Thanks mm-hmm. for Sharing, just the psychology mm-hmm. of music and getting into the characters who were... It was mm-hmm. a film about addiction. Mm-hmm. But how do, you, how do you see music play in with the psychology of characters or maybe even the psychology of the audience? To be honest with you, I, I try to get out of the way um, consciously. I try to get out of the way of the process as much as possible mm-hmm. and just try to read it in a more uh, um, instinctive way. Um, because I think that's where the music is coming from. That's where it's mm-hmm. happening. And so uh, by trying to get too clever about it, I think you know, you're slowing the process down. You know, I think music, making music is almost like a reflex. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like if I throw a ball at you and you have to consciously think about, where's the ball going? I'm going to catch it. I'm going to uh-huh. catch it. You can't. Playing an instrument is like that. It's a very much more instinctive, intuitive kind of process. And so for me, it's really just uh, hoping that um, I'm understanding a situation you know, correctly. I'm interpreting it intuitively in the right way. And and then I'll write from there. And if I'm mm-hmm. wrong about that, then I'll get some pushback from, um, you know, from production team or whoever, which I'm, you know, right, right. Uh, open to and often is very, very uh, productive kind of part of the process of saying, oh, you know, I didn't I never kind of saw that aspect yeah. of it. But just trying to kind of uh, feel it from that point of view. And I mean, it's that's what I'd always, I think a big part of why I love film music is kind of that psychological, how it makes you feel. Because as a listener, because I'm not a musician, mm. so I'm hearing it and seeing how it affects me emotionally. Yeah. And then you kind of, I don't know, it can be a very kind of reawakening kind of thing when you, especially I think for a lot of fans like me who found film music, it was just like, wow, you know, yeah. it's something that you don't really experience that you can't mm. experience elsewhere. Well, you know, just, just on that, I, you know, I think that, uh, we all know about the power of music i think once you team it up with words and you have a song you have an incredibly powerful thing because you're able to in a sense harness that music um uh to the to the bidding of this particular lyric which can be very powerful right you add visual images to that and you know you've got a real bombshell in your hand it's something that's incredibly powerful um but i think every composer knows that that there is an enormous responsibility with the music because you in the end, call the shots as far as the audience's emotional reaction to things, because that's the music's job. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, when I used to work on Pokemon, as a joke, every now and then us music editors would would do a, a, a wrong edit of an episode on purpose. So we'd score everything, you know, with, with music that we'd pull off soundtracks. And, uh-huh. and it was incredible that you could watch this, you know, light little uh, cartoon, and then you'd underscore it with horror music. And it's just... And it was horrible. You know, it was just <laughs> scary as hell. So, you know, you really know that there's this responsibility yeah. um, to ultimately um, provide the mood um, and uh, to a large degree the way an audience will interpret it. Absolutely. So, yeah. it's cool. And uh, you worked on a film last year called The Tall Man, which uh, had been, the score had been available digitally, but it was just released on CD, uh, so congratulations on that. Um, your co-composers on that film were uh, Todd Bryanton and Christopher Young, but it was a unique uh, scoring situation, which mm-hmm. happens every now and then in Hollywood. And how did you get involved with the project, and what were the musical requirements and needs of that film? Um, uh, I came on board pretty late in the day, um... Um, and it was almost just uh, happenstance that the uh, music supervisor was in the car with a director who was out here from France and happened to be playing my CD that he just received a couple of days before, I think, um, in the car. And the director, you know, responded to it and said, you know, let's call this guy. And so I got on board um, at a point where they, you know, they had some some stuff still to to be written and they weren't no they didn't know how to go about it um and um i think a lot a lot of music had already been written by uh todd Mm -hmm. and also by uh, chris young um and i think the director was just exploring different avenues to see what it would what it would bring um and so i was asked to do a cue 
and they liked it and I was brought back to do another one and another one um, and it wasn't an entirely collaborative process yeah, between kind of... myself and the other two composers um, it has been a little bit afterwards because I really loved what they did and I heard it to some extent while I was doing it so that we could try to you know try to integrate the, the sound of the score uh, I really love what Chris Young did and um, in a sense, it was kind of a privilege to be working, if not alongside him <laughs> physically, you know, on a project that he was on. Right. Um, and uh, so, you know, I've connected with, with Todd Bryant and since then, um, um, you know, just to kind of solidify that link, because I, I think we really... We, we do good work and it kind of worked out all, all together yeah it's, uh, it's, nicely yeah. it's interesting when that happens because I've talked to uh, it happens I think more often in video games where composers will work on the same project and never meet I was interviewing Warren Balf I was yeah. like so what was it like working with you know Jesper Kid for Assassin's Creed it's like oh I've never met yeah, him I never met him <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. it all worked well, out at the same, same time you know um, you're, you're meeting them at that at that uh, deep emotional place right you know, you're meeting their because, music yeah, yeah you're meeting their music and I think that tells you a lot and um uh so that's kind of how the whole thing started and then it kind of it gathered its own momentum um uh, and then i worked more directly with with the director he would actually we'd have skype calls and mm -hmm. and he would try to convey to me he had very specific ideas of what he wanted and um for example at the end of the film he 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 mentioned the word requiem you know, there's this, this end, this sense of, you know, kind of a musical eulogy mm -hmm. for, you know, for what had happened in the film. And it was a kind of resolution. And 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 so I thought I got it. Yep, I understand. I went off and I wrote a requiem. <laughs> 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 and, and then, you, you know, um, uh, he came back to me and said, well, it wasn't quite what I meant. When I said requiem, I meant more like a spiritual. And it was like a, <laughs> it was more of a language barrier. It's like, oh, uh -huh. yeah, more of a spiritual. I said, OK, all right. So. You're thinking more something like a solo piano in that sense. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so there's, you know, a little bit of backwards and forwards, but it was an interesting process. I definitely feel like, I, I remember feeling at the time like I'd find my calling because I just really, really love to write uh, music that is, uh, on the one hand, dark, yeah. but there's a kind of tragic quality to it and there's a romantic quality to it somewhere somewhere inside that it's just it's a place that um i, lo I love to explore um and so I, I just i loved the project a bit i really really enjoyed working on it i'd love to do more stuff like that yeah yeah well that's great that's on cd now so i yeah. think it's more for more people to to find it and explore it um i also want to ask you about your work with the society of composers and lyricists which is an amazing organization especially for up-and-coming composers uh you guys put together amazing events programs screenings with the composers with q and a's uh so what is your role in the society and why is it important to you i, I became involved uh while i was still living in new york mm -hmm. uh, i only moved to la two and a half years ago so while i was there um uh, I became part of a, a, a group at ASCAP called the Creator Circle that um, would look at some of the issues that, that um, uh, might affect composers uh, more particularly than just you know, composers and songwriters in general. And it was there that I was introduced to Dan Foliart, who was then, uh, he was then the president of the SCR. And it was very clear, um, I think, to him that it was time that there should be a presence for the SCL in New York. And from from my point of view and from other composers that I knew there, there was no organization at all in New York mm -hmm. to form any kind of community, um, to offer any kind of informational seminars, anything. There was really nothing. And it's, it's, a, it, it's as you know, it's a very lonely profession to be in. Yeah. You spend long hours by yourselves in a, in a padded cell. <laughs> and, and so I, I, I realized that this was, you know, something that needed to to have a presence in new york so i agreed to come on board there and we, we set up the uh the new york chapter then when i moved to la um uh i was encouraged by them to stay involved and i did and um just as a kind of a freelancer i started organizing events mm -hmm. you know, one of my great passions is music technology and i think that as composers we can never get enough in informa good information uh, it's a it's a world that's constantly changing. There's new sample libraries, there's new uh, ideas, there's new workflows, and things change 
uh, 360, no, 180 degrees <laughs> um, in, you know, in the space of a few years. Um, so uh, I started doing those kinds of events and then I was asked to, to come on board with the actual board of directors. And there I was tricked into becoming uh, <laughs> chairman of the seminar committee. So now um, I can kind of continue that work, um, but, you know, with, with the, the full support of, of the SCL. And I can tell you that for me personally, coming here uh, recently from, from somewhere else, it's enabled me to meet people and to find a footing, uh, in some cases, to meet real luminaries in the industry, um, people that uh that we've all heard of it's like my god this is i actually get to meet this person absolutely you know so it's i you know i feel it it's been very good to me which is why i'm very keen to give back um and i also think that i'm kind of at that point in my career it's very hard to make that kind of judgment of what when do you know yeah when am i the guy that starts telling other people (laughs) you know uh you never really know quite where you are you know, on, on the scale of things, but I feel like, um, it, it's time for me to kind of share some of the things that I've picked up and I've picked them up the hard way because again, I never went to school for this mm-hmm. and I've made an enormous amount of mistakes along the years. Um, and, uh, and definitely kind of learned the hard way, but I think it gives me some, hopefully some things that I can pass on. Absolutely. And it makes, yeah. I think your experience more yeah. unique and rewarding. So I definitely encourage, you know, any young composers out there to, to join the SCL. It's not expensive. It's about 135 a year, um, or $80 for students. And it is international. So anyone listening anywhere else in the world can get involved. All of the seminars are recorded. So as a member, you'll be able to, um, log into them online and listen to them, or they actually have videos of them. So you can, you know, see um, Hans Zimmer talking about uh, one or other film. You can, you can really, um, you know, another one we did recently was Breaking Bad. We had the whole crew from mm-hmm. Breaking Bad, uh, the composer Dave Porter and and Vince Gilligan, the show creator, was there in person. And you know, just really, really gives you these uh, insights and understandings about what it is we're doing, why are we doing it, right. and what is everyone else kind of how how do they approach it? You know, yeah. deal, deal with similar problems and. How do we get through some of the, you know, some of the challenges, uh, you know, um, particularly when we're very cut off from each other? Yeah. You know, are we all sane or are we kind of, <laughs> you need to kind of get a point of reference. Like, have I gone completely mad uh, or is everyone else mad like me? No, it's a yeah. great, I mean, I've, I've attended many of the screenings and it's just such a great resource. Just mm. not for, I mean, if I were a composer, I'd probably get even more out of it, but just right. as a music fan and a you know aspiring screenwriter filmmaker it's still yeah. an amazing resource yeah um but uh to to kind of close up well, are you working on anything that you're allowed to talk about right now any upcoming projects well i mean there's a couple of projects that i that i did that uh, uh recently they're close to my heart um and I, I try to do some of these uh every now and then they're more kind of just labor of love because they're they're low or no budget things. right but uh one of them was a, a short film uh, called uh, Across All Borders, mm-hmm. and it's for the um, uh, it's for an organisation uh, called Global Learning Across Borders, and it, they basically what they do and what they did in this film is they took um, uh, kids from uh, schools in the Bronx, in this case, um, for a once in a lifetime experience to go to India and wow. to Dharamsala and to uh, experience something that they may never do in their lives. Right. And the idea of it is it's going to give them something that um, that can even help them uh, in a college interview because they can talk about an interesting experience that they've had. Um, and I think it changes them uh, as, as kids. And so it follows that kind of short journey. And it's a very, very beautiful piece. And I think, uh, you know, it's such a pleasure to work on that, on that kind of stuff. Um, the other one I did, working with the same director is a short animation for an organization called Maplight that um, tries to shine a light on um, corruption in politics in the US. Yeah. And um, it's quite shocking, <laughs> um, uh, really, when, when you understand the, the mighty powers of, uh, of lobby and how they oh, influence yeah, yeah. the way um, laws are written or rewritten uh, for, in their own interest. And it's really quite important that that kind of thing 
see the light of day, that people understand what it is that's going on here. And so where I can lend my skills to help support those kinds of projects, uh, I like to do that. Um, beyond that, um, I've got a few things in the pipeline. Um, I don't know if I can talk <laughs> much about them. Well, One of them is particularly interesting, and I'm, I had a conversation today. I very much hope it does come through. Um, it is a 3D IMAX series. Oh, wow. Which is um, not something that I think has really been done, and it's focused around um, art. And the idea is to bring an experience of art in in... Uh, in, in three dimensions but in a way that's really never been shown before in a palpable oh. sense to people that may never uh, have an opportunity to go and see some of these incredible uh, creations that wow. happen across time so so that one I, I'm hoping that um, that will come through and if it does I'll have some interesting stuff to talk about because it's, oh, it's definitely that's... not your typical <laughs> kind of film project um, and uh, there's another documentary that uh, that's coming up, and I've got, uh, if all goes well, another um, a bigger David Attenborough one next year called Conquest of the Skies, mm. which is, um, I believe, going to be a two-part um, 3D, uh, and then eventually IMAX as well, um, uh, a film about the history of flight uh, in animals. Wow. And so that promises to be... You know, a nice one, and 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 hopefully, you know, I'll get an orchestra for that. <laughs> we'll do we'll do something big, well, which I think be... the history of flight deserves. Oh yeah, deserves an orchestra. Absolutely. Right? So if you're listening, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's that's kind of what I've got on my plate here, um, and uh, um, as I mentioned before, I'm also I've been kind of getting back into the neuroscience side of things. Right. Um, I was asked. Uh, a year ago to speak at a conference on music and neuroscience um, uh, from the perspective of a composer but also because I have some you know some knowledge of, of neuroscience and I spoke on uh, music and emotions and that led to my being asked to write uh, an article for a, a scientific journal called Frontiers in Neuroscience uh, which I'm finishing today and <laughs> wow. it's all done and then I just have to proof it um, and so it's kind of it's triggered that re-triggered that interest uh, in me and and it's something I'd like to continue to do um, because um, whereas once I was maybe kind of looking at it from the scientific point of view now I'm very much I've been so immersed in the world of composing for, for quite quite a number of years that I really am just a composer at this point and uh -huh. I really really uh, like the uh, the way that we as kind of composers can can look at this process yeah yeah of, of what it is we do and try to Kind of just unravel it or just just if not unravel it just bask at the ultimate mystery of of how one creates art and where it comes from and do we do it or do we channel it or yeah. how the hell does it happen you know does it come through the brain or, or in some part of course it does and how does that all work mm. where in the brain um and so i'd like to continue writing about that and 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 see if i've you know got something to offer there so well, that's, that's keep amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Joel, uh, you're always you're one of my favorite composers. Thank you're you. one of the most interesting people and just so smart and intelligent. What you're doing, I think, is fantastic. It's just so inspiring. So thank, thank you, you so much for uh, inviting me to your home and, and talking today. It was a great honor and privilege. Thank you, Kaya. <laughs> great. <laughs> mm -hmm.